Hey guys, what is up? Welcome to another episode of IGN House Call, the only time where we have human interaction every week. I miss it. Today we have with us none other than uh, Adam Shah. I think he requires no introduction. He is a veteran Dota 2 player. Uh, he most famously uh, got fourth place in TI6. Dang. Uh, yeah, and after that he moved on to several other teams. So a very exciting period for him. Thanks Adam for being with us. Okay, so before we start anything, for the people at home who don't know who you are, who probably don't play or follow Professional Dota 2, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, what's up guys? My name's Adam. Uh, I go by 343. Currently teamless. Uh, played for Fnatic and Complexity a bit in the past two or three years. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Wow, very simple introduction. So Adam, tell us a bit more about how you got to pick up Dota 2 and sort of begin that journey towards becoming a professional player, especially during a time when esports was not as recognized as it is today. Back when I was like 11, my best friend played Dota and he introduced the game to me. So we used to like go to Saru Cafe and play with his like elder brother and friends, and then. Maybe two or three years down the road, we started playing in like clan war rooms, you know, the scrims, you know, where you feel pro. And I actually enjoyed the scrim aspect of the game, like the the competitive aspect of the game uh, compared to the pubs that I played a lot. And from those clan rooms, it kind of I kind of got to know people, and we ended up going to a few land tournaments, met more people, eventually, blah blah. Fast forward a few years, and then. Uh, ended up uh, getting an offer to substitute for Fnatic because uh, I think Mushi was taking a break. Yeah, and then I played with them and I asked if I could stay on as a sub, and they said yes. And then eventually I became part of the main roster. Okay, so Adam, recently uh, I know that a few times in your career you have become a coach for I think it was Fnatic, was it? Yeah, fanatic complexity. Uh, the coaching one. I think it was only those two teams. Hey, right, so right now, I want to ask you, like, how? What did it feel like transitioning from a pro player to a coach? Was there anything different? Mm, I think the biggest thing is that uh, you you kind of give up a lot of power. Like as a coach, your your role. Mm, how do I put this? What you do for a team is very out of the game. It's very, it's a lot of prep. It's a lot of pre-game and like training, and it's the practice days leading up to a tournament. But when you're playing a tournament game itself, all you can do is watch. There's nothing you can't be part of the game really. So you know that was probably the hardest part. It's like accepting that the power is not in your hands anymore. Right? Does it make you like? Frustrated when you watch the games, you know you have that, that little room where you can watch your team play. As a coach, does it make you frustrated or angry, or maybe like what kind of emotions go through you when you watch your team play? I think generally I'm a pretty calm person. Like I would, uh, I think you have to look at things objectively because you want to be the third person, right? In in your team, you don't want to be part of the team in some sense because you don't want to be. At the same level they are, and you don't want to be learning and experiencing the same things they are. You want to bring a different experience to the team, and something new, some new ideas. So, for me at least, I don't feel much watching. I mean, obviously it's nice when they win. Like I'm supportive of the team. It sucks when they lose, you know. But、uh, I try my best not to get emotionally involved. So, as a coach,、um, how do you? Train a team. Like, what's the biggest difference? Like, when you are like a player, right? You listen to the coach, but as a player, do they actually listen to you a hundred percent? I think it's very based on the team.、Uh, I think at least in Dota right now, there's no specific job for a coach.、Uh, my understanding of it is that you should try and fill the holes that the team has. So if the team is、uh, does A B C well and D E F not so well, you should try and fill D E F. For example, in previous teams, like maybe,、uh, maybe in one of my teams, it was hard for the captain to get his message across. And you know, I'm pretty decent at talking to people, so like, I'll try to instill his idea in other people. 
but that being that would not apply if I were to coach a different team. You know, it was a very team specific thing. You want to try and elevate the levels of where your team are, like individually as a team as a whole, and you want to just help your team improve wherever you can. Okay, that being said, that's very interesting for you to say that because uh, you're talking about uh, being on the sidelines as a coach, only be uh, being able to watch your team perform whether they lose or not or win. So, what can we expect from three four three this year and in the coming years in the future? Are you planning to uh, um, carry on being a player, or are are you open to becoming a coach? What's in store? Mm, I tried a bit of casting this year. I'm definitely still looking to play. I don't really mind coaching as well. I don't really have like a something that I really want right now. Well, I'm kind of okay doing everything, but it also depends with who. Like, uh, I think if I was given a choice, I would definitely love to play. But I don't want to just play with uh, a team I don't believe in just to play. You know, like it doesn't feel. Um, it feels like I'm lying to myself if I do that. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I tried casting recently. I enjoyed it a lot. I wouldn't mind pursuing that, and I think coaching is coaching is in a weird place right now. When I coached before, and like everything I said previously, it was two or three years ago, and coaches back then weren't like part of the draft or they weren't like that involved in a team. But right now, a coach is, I would say, pretty crucial in top tier teams, and they have a much bigger role. I would say, even though they're more behind the scenes. So yeah, I'm pretty willing to do that as well. Okay, so I blanked out. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your casting. Like, how did that start? Um, that's a tough one. I don't remember actually. Uh, I think it was through. Um, I was talking to a few casters and I like kind of dropped the idea and then. Someone sort of gave me a try. I think it was who, who was it? Killer Pigeon, maybe. They, he just got like pro players on to like talk about games and stuff, you know. And you know, I, at the start was kind of bad at it. Like I'm pretty, what's the word? Soft spoken, so you know, like I mumble a lot and stuff like that. But you know, I'm working on it, and I think like I, I realized that I just enjoy talking about Dota, you know, and. Without a team, there wasn't really a platform for me to do that for like the past few months, and casting actually gave me that. So that's kind of why I enjoyed it so much. So, do you think you're more of an analytical kind of caster, or are you more sh- hype shoutcaster? Mm, I think I can be hype, but by nature, I'm probably more analytical. Well, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, consider your personality. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, so no uh, I want I want to say beyond me. Oh, sorry. Could you repeat that? I said I wouldn't play beyond me to like, uh, be the guy that's doing play by play and stuff. But I think I can be a bit monotonous sometimes and a bit more. I don't feel the hype as much at times, you know. So it's probably better if someone else does it. Okay, that totally makes sense. Okay, so moving on, Dota 2 has had some patches recently. How do you think the meta has changed since TI last year? Is it a, a dramatic change? Mm, I don't really remember what TI last year was like, but right now the meta feels like it's very um, lane heavy. Like if you lose your lane too heavily, it's actually really hard to play a game because it's a lot about um, getting map control and just using more of the map than your opponents and slowly playing from there. I think like that's how it is in top tier Dora right now. So yeah, I would say it's really lane focused. So it being lane focused, do you think it uh, as a spectator sport, where Dota is famous for its um, action pack uh, uh, team battles, do you think the current meta being so lane uh, focused will take away some of the excitement? Yeah, I think so. But so far, the games that we've had, at least the games I've watched, have not been boring. Even though, um, even though the lanes usually go okay, though, is the thing. Like, it's very rare that you get to see some lane get um, 
it's very seldom that you see a lane be very one-sided. So it kind of doesn't happen as much and the games are pretty even unless the teams are pretty big in big gap in terms of skill. So, so far I wouldn't say it takes away a lot from viewership. Maybe just the pace of the game at some point. The, as an example for like, maybe at 20 minutes, one team's up like 10k goal and they just can't end the game. You know? And the game has to go on to like 35 or 40 minutes to end the game. And during that period, it's kind of like, not really a chance for the opponent to come back into the game, but at the same time, the first team can't like end the game, you know? So I think that's like, where it gets kind of boring. All right, all right. Okay, let's talk about the uh, competitive uh, scene in C. So you most recently played for Alpha Hashtag. Um, in your opinion, what are the uh, hottest Southeast Asian teams to look out for this season? And bonus question, mm-hmm. if you could choose four teammates to make a team with, who would it be? Um, I'll answer the teams first. Uh, I think T1 and Boom look pretty good recently. Uh, Boom just won ESL Asia, I believe. Uh, I think T1 is going to be a scary team to look out for. Mm. Teammates... Mm. Let me think. Maybe... Maybe... I don't know, actually. That's a real tough question. <laughs> Probably Mushi. Mushi? Yeah. Mm. Moshi, Nana. Mm. Who else? Let me think. Moshi, Nana. DJ. Mm. Universe? Yeah. But he is retired. He just announced it. All right, he'll come back. He'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is basically your Dota 2 dream team, basically. Maybe. I wouldn't know till I actually play with them. Okay, but for real though, if you could have anyone on your team, think of it as a Dota 2 Dream Team, who would you have? Well, I'll just take like four members of OG, you know? Just... <laughs> How convenient. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, so to those newbies who look up to you, like 343 is the senpai, what do you have to say to the Southeast Asian team players? Not Southeast Asian. Well, let me just start that again. <laughs> what do you have to say to the Southeast Asian players looking to break into the pro scene? Mm, I think it's important to have a backup plan. Like getting into esports and Dota is not easy. It's always it's one thing to like join a team and play, but it's one another thing to like, actually make it to events. You know, it's a pretty rough road I would say so you just gotta be realistic with yourself you know you, I'm not saying don't go for it if you want to go for it like dedicate yourself and go for it but you can't like do it for five years not go anywhere and like mm-hmm. give up on your life you know it doesn't work that way you always gotta have a backup because esports is always gonna be unstable um, I think that is totally sound advice uh, the importance of having a safety net not just in esports I think in any um, uh, endeavor you take on you gotta have that uh, backup plan and just make sure that you're covered uh, for the future uh, okay so we are uh, close to the end of this episode of House Call but before I wrap things up uh, do you have anything to say to your fans? Uh, those of you who have supported me all the way like thanks so much I appreciate it um, still gonna try to play Dota and you know, Hopefully, I'll get a team soon. See what happens. Uh, appreciate it a lot. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much, Adam, for coming to our episode of IGN House Call. To those of you guys watching, thank you as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe to us. And we will see you guys next week with another mystery guest. Bye, guys. <laughs>